You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Rick Skinner, Senior Consultant. The end of the Second World War led to a new world order in which the Soviet Union and the United States emerged as rival global powers. But the peace replicated this old order of the aftermath of the First World War and its destruction of countries and colonies, including the starvation and death of hundreds of thousands of people and long-term health problems for many of those who survived. Moreover, within a few more years, the world experienced the fastest rate of population growth than at any previous time in history. So rapid and extensive was the growth that concern mounted that population increases would outstrip the world's basic but essential resources, food, water, fuel, and trigger environmental degradation of the globe. The population bomb did not explode. And thanks to what was termed the Green Revolution, food production more than matched population growth. As countries produced more food than their own populations consumed, the export of surplus food became important. Improvements in the transport of food made it possible to market and sell surplus food beyond a country's immediate neighbors, so food went global, with foreign crops making up 69% of country food supplies and farm production. The classic fast food cheeseburger eaten today includes more than 50 ingredients sourced from countries in every continent of the world, except the Arctic. That food system was a marvel. Unfortunately, today, the COVID-19 pandemic is disrupting that system to the point that in the midst of record food productivity across the globe, people may soon be dying from starvation at rates and in numbers greater than the toll of the virus. It is a cruel irony at work here. But the system of food production and distribution turned out to be much more fragile than anticipated. And the good news that the world's population could be fed instead projects that 10% of rural population could starve before the pandemic is brought under control. We are most fortunate to have with us someone who has both studied agriculture around the world and been a policymaker in government dealing with agriculture and food. If that were not enough, she served as dean of the largest agricultural college in American higher education and was president of one of the nation's great land grant universities. Elsa Marano was born in Havana, Cuba, lived in Caribbean and Latin American countries before migrating to the United States, where she earned her bachelor's degree from Florida International University and a master's and doctorate from Virginia Tech. Dr. Moreno began her career as assistant professor at Iowa State University, moved to Texas A&M where she was director of Center for Food Safety in the Institute of Food Science and Engineering from 1997 to 2001 as associate and then full professor in the Department of Animal Science. In 2001, President George W. Bush appointed her Undersecretary for Food Safety in the U.S. Department of Agriculture until 2005 when she returned to A&M as Director of the Texas Agricultural Experiment Station with its $155 million budget and $100 million of research grants. She served as Vice Chancellor and Dean of Agriculture at A&M and in 2007 became the first woman and first Hispanic President of Texas A&M. After leaving the office of president, Dr. Moreno became director of the Norman Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture at Texas A&M with projects conducted in Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East in Latin America and the Caribbean. Welcome Dr. Moreno to Innovators. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be here. My first question has a couple of parts to it, so bear with me a little bit. First of all, how do you characterize the kinds of advances we've seen in our understanding of the biological system and its applications to agriculture? Are they truly as revolutionary as the discoveries in the physics of the early 20th century? And then the second part is, how do those advances translate to the subsistence farmer in Mexico, 
uh, the Maasai tribesman who's herding cattle, or the Texan who decides I'm going to grow peanuts this year, or whatever the case may be. And then finally, as a dean, what do those advances mean when you go out to hire faculty for your college, when you were in that position? Have we really revolutionized biology in some way? I would say so. And it's obviously not, we're not done yet. Progress continues um, as it should. Of course, it all began with what, you know, a lot of people talk about as biotechnology, where you're manipulating the, the genetics of plant systems, cropping systems, et cetera, to prove those, those systems uh, in terms of uh, providing them resistance to diseases or tolerance to drought, things of that nature. But even without going to that extreme, if you want to call it that, uh, we have made tremendous advances just even in the science of producing uh, agricultural products without necessarily uh, biotechnology. Biotechnology is fantastic mm -hmm. because of what it can do. But I'll give you examples. Uh, we have developed ways to utilize mathematical modeling systems, for example, so that we know, and, and it's what we call precision agriculture. Mm -hmm. We know exactly, depending on the crop, depending on the soil conditions, depending on the temperature, the weather, et cetera, the type of irrigation water, for example, a type of fertilizer, when to apply it, how much to apply it, so that you're maximizing the yields uh, and minimizing the cost mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. producing said food because you, as a farmer, you have to buy all of those inputs. Mm -hmm. And so that efficiency, that increase in efficiency uh, has really revolutionized agriculture over the last uh, few decades. Uh, in fact, not even decades, I would say the last 10 years or so. Having said that, we also continue with the advances in the, the basic sciences. We talked about biotechnology, but the, the one that's been the most uh, exciting maybe for, to people um, is gene editing. Yes. Because unlike biotechnology, as you know, where you're inserting genes from other organisms into plant systems mm -hmm. or what have you, with gene editing, you're not doing that. You are manipulating the genetics, the genes that are already inherent in the DNA of that plant cell, for example, and turning off genes, turning on genes, you know, whatever you need to do to, uh, again, enhance the ability of that plant uh, system to produce. And then on the side of all of that uh, is also the tremendous advances that have been made uh, regarding the, the environment that surrounds the production of those uh, plant systems, for example. And by that, I mean, for example, soil, okay? Uh. Something that's very interesting to me, I'm a microbiologist, a food mm -hmm. microbiologist, but mm -hmm. a microbiologist nonetheless. And uh, in the last few years, we have learned a lot about soil microbiology, so that there's microorganisms in the soil that help plants absorb nutrients mm -hmm. better than they would otherwise. Mm -hmm. So things of that nature are just, not only fascinating, but a revolutionizing uh, the way that we produce uh, food crops um, in agriculture, doing so in a way that is as efficient as possible, that produces the highest quality, highest yield uh, of production as we, as we can possibly muster without uh, degrading the soil or the nutrients to a, a, an extent that then we're not able to produce any, anymore. And then the last part of all that, that I will tell you, which is kind of related also with uh, the environment in which we produce these, these crops, as well as food animals, livestock, is the whole idea of, of doing it in a way that is sustainable. Okay, and I kind of alluded to it just a second ago, mm -hmm. but sustainable in the sense that you are uh, replenishing the nutrients in the soil. You are not uh, exhausting the, 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 the water resources, for example. Uh, you're utilizing also more natural ways of uh, producing these crops. For example, we have a project uh, at the Borlaug Institute at Texas A&M University in Central America on coffee. Very important, I would call it a cash crop. Yes. Because it's not food per se, even though obviously a lot of us love coffee and drink it. Uh, no I, question. It's a food I, I to me. I have my fourth cup right here. Right here. Exactly. It is definitely a food to me, but, but it's, a, it's a cash crop because these farmers grow this crop for the livelihood that it can provide them, the, the uh, financial gain. And so uh, a crop like that 
can be susceptible as a lot of crops are to various diseases. And in the last few years, there's been a disease of coffee called leaf rust disease. It's a fungus, okay? Yes. It affects the leaves of the, of the plant. They look like they're rusty, you know, they're orange and it kills the plant. And you can imagine you're a farmer, a coffee farmer. It takes at least three years uh, for your crop to, to grow. So you plant it and say on year two, here comes a fungus wipes you out. You have to start all over again. And then maybe it happens again and you have to start all over again. So it wipes you out completely and you have to decide what am I going to do to feed my family for the income that I need. And so in cases like that, um, you can have systems where sure you can apply fungicide and try to get rid of the fungus, but that costs money. And these farmers, their, their margin of profit is extremely small. So it's much better to do a, a system where, for example, you have insects, you know, naturally occurring insects for worms, for example, that may eat the fungus, okay? And then birds in the canopy of where the uh, coffee is being produced that will then eat those, those uh, insects as well in due time. So, so it's kind of an ecosystem that is all balanced. Exactly. And it's, it's a lot smarter way to do it than just constantly, you know, having to purchase materials that will help you grow the product. Not to say that there's, that's not necessary as well, but if you minimize that, again, it's about minimizing the, the cost of production, making it as efficient as possible so that the profit for those farmers is as large as it can be. We've had projects in Rwanda where, you know, farmers have, have said to me, you know, now I can send my kids to, to school. I can buy medicine for my family. Uh, and it's, it's revolutionary. We have learned that it's not about just feeding people, it's about elevating them out of poverty. So you help them come out of poverty, they come out of hunger as well, okay? It doesn't help to show farmers how to grow potatoes if that's all they can eat. They won't starve to death, but that's not a nutritionally sound diet, mm -hmm. uh, and they're still poor. But if you help them grow a crop or a food animal for which there's a market, and they engage in that value chain mm -hmm. where they are part of that market. Uh, it elevates them out of poverty and then they can purchase foods that they maybe were not able to purchase before, uh, or it allows them more time, for example, to then plant horticulture crops, you know, fruits, vegetables, which are certainly very nutritionally mm -hmm. sound. Um, so it's a complex system like that, that I think science has done a tremendous uh, service to in advancing the knowledge of how to uh, do this as efficiently as possible. And what's that, what strikes me is how systemic it is, is that it's not just let's deal with the nematode or the rust problem, let's, let's go at this systemically so that you not only protect against the rust disease, but you also take other steps that will make the, the process a closed loop of, of relative good health. Perfect. What does that mean for faculty though? I'm, I'm trying to think of, you're talking about a level of science that's pretty detailed, that we don't necessarily associate with uh, lectures about corn crops. So what does this mean for the kind of faculty you hire? Yeah, excellent question. Um, because of this science revolution, if you will, we have to have, frankly, at a university, uh, the size of Texas A&M, uh, certainly uh, we have the largest agriculture program in the U.S. We have to have faculty that are very much uh, in tune with, this, uh, with these advances, that have not only the, the background in uh, how to conduct the scientific uh, studies you know, to advance this knowledge, but that are at the cutting edge and, and are uh, really availing themselves of the best science uh, that's, that's possible uh, with the right equipment, uh, laboratory space, and so forth, students of a high caliber. Mm -hmm. and, and frankly, that are connected, and this is very important in my mind, is to, that are connected with the needs of that agriculture sector. This is where the extension system is so very important mm -hmm. because those professionals have their finger on the pulse of what agricultural producers need here in the U.S., certainly in other parts of the world, and, and they can be the ones that work with the researchers, the basic researchers, to kind of uh, connect each other so that uh, the scientists in the lab can do the kind of work that helps 
uh, address very practical problems that uh, producers have and the extension specialists be the ones that facilitate that communication. Let me go back to what you, you started with something very interesting. The size and scale of a university plays an extremely important role. By that, I mean, you have to have a, a place. Yes. A it has extraordinary capacity in both in human terms, but also has to have facilities and laboratories, then has to have connections. Yeah. And those connections are not simply to other universities and other researchers or, and so forth. It's all the way out to the fields themselves. And then I made two notes that I want to make sure I understand. They're going to specialize. These people are not likely to, they're going to be generals. They're going to come with a very specific field in mind. And so you may need several of them. They have to be researchers. They can't just be walk out on the field and, and so forth. They have to be research intensive. And then something that I never thought of, and I guess I should have, they can't be siloed from one another. Right. And that is, the, uh, to me, to be honest with you, that is the, the biggest uh, challenge always has been because researchers, you know, we like to stay in our lab, do our thing that interests, you know, talk us. Talk to their friends and talk to their colleagues. Exactly. So it's up to administrators to find incentives, you know, ways to promote collaboration. Certainly funding agencies, whether it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture, NIH, NSF, mm -hmm. have done that. They, they put out requests for proposals that, that are interdisciplinary. And so that kind of gets faculty together just automatically because that's the only way they can, they can get the funding is if they, if they work with each other. So, so those kinds of incentives have been extremely important. Now, we at the Borough Institute, because we work internationally, where the rubber meets the road, if you will, because it's where you really have to bring the knowledge and apply it to real life, real world experiences of these farmers. We, our challenge is to, to try to incentivize these basic scientists to, to work with us too, to, to make them realize, you know, what you're doing in the lab is terrific. It's great that you're getting these publications and grants and all of that. That's fantastic. What and? Look how you can impact the lives of real people. Exactly. Um, and, and when they get a glimpse of that, I tell you, they, it, it's a tremendous motivator that they maybe had not been exposed to before. I credit that Dr. Norman Borlaug himself. He was a basic scientist, and yet did. he used to say that to all of us you know, who had the privilege of knowing him, is that it's up to you that whatever you do in life helps people directly. And so, so when I you could add. So I could add to the question of scale, specialization. I could add and in, in, in interdisciplinary. People have to be networked yes. to be successful mm -hmm. in this field. And by that, I mean not just the person that you should spend Friday afternoon drinking beer with, with when they were in graduate school, <laughs> but you may oh. need to know the person in Ethiopia mm -hmm. who is the happens to be the uh, the biochemist who knows pretty much what you need to do to get good Ethiopian coffee or whatever the case may be. So you're asking at the outset for someone who's capable of doing this, not as they grow along. That means you have to compete for some not terribly abundant resources. Finding someone who at a relatively early part of their career is knowledgeable, networked, likes doing interdisciplinary, has no problems seeking funding for, to support their work, knows what kind of facilities they need, but also has some sort of license at the outset to go out and create networks that can impact the Maasai warrior, mm -hmm. the subsistence economist, a farmer in Costa Rica, or, and so forth. So that leads me to ask what I think is probably the next part of this question. Borlaug was the exception to the rule by any stretch of the imagination, he was an exceptional human being. Mm -hmm. Are there more Borlaugs out there? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I can tell you there are. Uh, I have the privilege of serving on the Council of Advisors to the World Food Prize, which uh, you may know is, is the yes. Nobel Prize of yes. Agriculture. Dr. Borlaug helped found it many years ago. And so um, every year the World Food Prize recognizes you know, a, a Borlaug type of scientist, uh, somebody who, who has uh, dedicated their career as a researcher to look at 
how to address with science uh, some of the biggest problems with a specific cropping system, you know, whatever it may be, maybe a plant pathologist, maybe uh, a nutrition researcher uh, that maybe is looking to um, really increase, for example, the vitamin A content of a certain kind of crop, you know, anything like that. And so it's amazing to me uh, all over the world and certainly here in the U.S., there's, there's plenty of dedicated scientists who, who um, are following in Dr. Borlaug's footsteps is, is what I can tell you. My job here at the Borlaug Institute, as we have our own scientists here at Texas A&M and certainly in, at other universities with whom we collaborate, is to be the conduit to focus them on bring to their attention what the problems are in various specific areas. And then in that way, connect them to here's a problem, help us solve it, you know, with, with the knowledge that you have. It's not easy, you're right, because support wise, we live in, in a society that's becoming more and more urban by the day. Okay. And so people are, are not as aware of, of the importance of agriculture as maybe they used to be, right? And that's always been a, uh, an issue for all of us. Who There's work. an irony to that. Yes. It's a bit and of so irony. Convincing these, uh, you know, especially people of influence, you know, members of legislatures and, and so forth, that they need to, to invest in this is, is the trick. And so you have to show them that agriculture is not just the, the farmer with the plow. You know, agriculture is life. Without agriculture, not only is there not food to eat, but safe water to drink, clothing, you know, from exactly. uh, producing cotton uh, and so forth. So that is our responsibility, uh, those of us who work in the science of, of agriculture, is to convince those who, who can help us, you know, why it's so important. And I think, you know, we've done a pretty good job because people do recognize that not only food is important, but they recognize also that, you know, around the world, um, the, the degree of hunger, uh, if anything, has increased. And that's even before the COVID-19 pandemic. Now it's even worse. Yeah. And if we don't do something to help uh, alleviate these situations, it comes back to us in the U.S., you know, because when people are desperate because there's hunger, there's poverty, they will do desperate things conflict will happen, migration, all kinds of things will happen that then we have to try to fix. So Dr. Borlaug used to say, you know, addressing hunger uh, will prevent conflict as opposed to trying to then address the conflict after it's already, you know, started. It's easier to address hunger to prevent conflict. And he was absolutely right. And so, convincing, yeah, convincing people that that's what we need to be doing, it's in our own best interest here in the US to do that. I'll, I'll come back to the irony in a minute. <laughs> I had to switch gears a little bit. About 25 years ago, there was talk at the time that ag schools, they Students weren't attracted to them. The, the, you know, the programs just didn't have enough enrollment and so forth. Then, I guess that's been within the last 10 years, I'd say, we hear of colleges of agriculture that have waiting lists of students to get in. What happened? Because it's happened very quickly. It does have seemed to have some generational component, but it also involves people in mid midlife suddenly decided, nope, I'm going back to agriculture. What happened? How do you account for that? I, I think, I mean, it's, it's not a simple answer, but I, I honestly believe, I agree with you that some of it is generational. Mm -hmm. I, not a week goes by without me having a student here come and say, send me to one of the countries where you're working, Dr. Morano. You know, I want to do something. I think it's these young people want to do significant things. They want to <laughs> do stuff that matters, that, that saves the world, if you will. You know, they, they want to be heroes, right? Yes. And so it's funny to me because it used to be years and years ago, if somebody would come up to me like that and I would tell them, well, you know, this is not a vacation. You know, if you go to our project in Ethiopia, you're going to have to do this and this and this, roll up your, your sleeves and get to work. And it, that used to deter them. Not, not this generation of young people. They say, okay, I'm ready. Let's go. So they're not afraid of hard work. They're very empathic. And I think for that reason, when they see others suffering, they want to do something about it. 
Uh, they want their, their lives to matter. They want to do significant things. And so when they see others uh, around the world suffering, they realize, boy, that's, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to help that, fix that. So part of it is that, okay? Part of it also is, as we were talking about at the beginning, there's a certain coolness, you know, to the, the fact that agriculture is very science uh, focused. Yes. And so that kind of triggers that, that interest in, in people. And then I would have to say also when you see what's going on with uh, the effects on climate and so forth, that has brought these issues up to the, to the forefront. And so um, that has made people think, okay, wait a minute, if this is happening, how can I use my mm -hmm. field of study, whether I'm an economist or I'm a, a biochemist or whatever I am, to maybe uh, apply it to, to do my part to alleviate some of these threats? You know, it's fascinating you should say that. Yesterday or earlier this week, I was talking to a, a young faculty member. Her name is Caroline Bucky. She's at Harvard Public Health. But she likes to point out that she, she's a zoologist. So she became fascinated living in Africa for a while about malaria. Here is a disease that simply will not go away. Right. Money and everything. And she told me at the end of our conversation, as much as I value the research I do, if I could change somebody's life so that a child no longer has to live at best an impaired life, that's what I want to do. She must be 40. And so I, I, I think you're spot on. I sensed exactly what you're talking about. Not just that young people today aspire to something, but they can see it happen. Mm -hmm. When the young woman came from Norway and spoke before the UN, the young woman from uh, uh, um, Afghanistan who came and talked about how you, if you could just empower women. I think they're now seeing that it's not only important and good, but you actually can do it. You can so do I'm it. But yeah. by the fact that, that at least, if nothing else has gone right, one of them is that it's led young people to believe I can make a difference. And so therefore you pursue this. And it's also made science cool again. That's the other part, I think. No, no yeah. question about it. And you know, it's, it's all coming full circle because mm -hmm. um, I think scientists are realizing that, yeah, whatever their specific field of study, it does have an application to life and the the best platform is agriculture because they're so so diverse there's so many angles to it you just talked about a zoologist you know look at the pandemic we're living through precisely it's a, a wildlife you know mm -hmm. uh related uh event that uh, people with that expertise you know can be tremendously helpful um i'm a food microbiologist as i said food safety is is my my field mm -hmm. and um you know, nothing impacts human health more directly than the food you eat. Uh, in my case, if it's contaminated with microorganisms that will cause disease, that's, that's what I want to prevent. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you think about nutrition, you know, chronic diseases, you know, the, the high cost of healthcare that we have is because of chronic illnesses that people suffer through uh, that maybe, in some cases, diet could help mitigate it. So uh, the more we know about how that can be done, the better, be it cancer or uh, diabetes, whatever it may be. So Almost any of them. Tomorrow I'm talking to a young uh, extension agent in, at Mississippi State University who is basically dealing with nutrition. He said, look, yes, I can go out and tell somebody what cotton to grow or what are soybeans or whatever but I'm more interested and I'm gonna spend most of my time working with families. And very quick to say, it's gotta be families, you can't be individuals. And I thought, this is an extension agent? You know, the guy with the boot up on the back of the, the C-150 Ford truck? <laughs> and his answer was, yeah, that's me. And I thought, well, okay, that's fine. L let me turn to a, a, an inside baseball question. Okay, so this is, we talked about your field, but I, I wanna talk about the administrative world of academia because it's one, quite candidly has us a little bit bedeviled. Number one, there was a time in, 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 in academia, because I'm old enough to remember, <laughs> that when it came time for somebody to become a department, a new department chair was needed, you, you literally drew straws and whoever lost got the short one 
had to go be department chair for three to five years. And, and, and invariably, when you said, all right, I'll do it this one time, the dean would come to you and beg and plead and offer you incentives, and you would stay another year or two. What happened to the role of the department chair that has made it? Nobody wants those jobs. So increasingly, you find that deans have to invest a position to go outside for someone to come in. I have to confess, I was a department chair once. Uh, uh, I lasted two and a half years. <laughs> that's all I could take. But something's gone on that where it used to be seen as, well, that's just part of the, of the profession. People don't want to do the job now. And while it has some stature and so forth outside of academia, within academia, as soon as somebody gets named chair of a department, everybody says, oh, I'm so sorry. What well, happened I think, with that position? Uh, there's, there's two things. One is, and, and I will say at the outset, in my opinion, department chair, department head is the toughest position at any university. And why? Because that's the person that is between the rock and the hard place, right? Is the person that uh, helps guide the department, faculty have needs and expectations and all of that, and expect that department chair to be their advocate with the, with the dean and the administration. Meanwhile, the dean uh, wants that, faculty, that, that department head or chair to uh, implement his or her vision, okay? Whether the faculty like it or not. So you are between the rock and the hard place. Uh, you can't win because you can never please the dean 100% of the time. You can never please the faculty 100% of the time. And part of it, in my opinion, what's caused it to be that way is um, we have gone to a, a system in academia where the department heads are not as independent as they used to be. They are, their budgets, everything is so dependent on upper administration, okay, that they have very small room for mm -hmm. doing anything creative. You know, they may not have money for positions, you know, they have to, you know, compete with the other departments and make the case for why I need to hire two or three faculty members and all of that. And it makes it very, very difficult not having the resources to really uh, be creative. And I've always been a believer that you have to prime the pump. If you want the pump to, to pump, you know, vigorously, you have to prime it. And as, as administrators need to provide the resources to those department chairs to do what they need to do, what they think is best, hold them accountable, okay? It's not a free for all, but simply say, you know, uh, here's, here's your opportunity, provide me your strategic plan of what you're gonna do in your department, I'll give you the resources, and I'm gonna hold you accountable to the very things that you have said you're gonna do, okay? As opposed to what we see in some universities where everything gets taken up, all the resources taken up to the, to the top, mm -hmm. the department chairs, are left just kind of managing the best they can. It's very frustrating to the faculty because they're not getting what they want. The department chair is not able to get them that. And so he or she is, is seen as ineffective or whatever. And so it's a, a very difficult position to be in unless, yes. like I say, you're given that freedom because of resources that you're yes. able to, to put into what you think needs to be done in that department. And I'd add to that if you decide as a department chair, well, I'm going to go out and raise money, you quickly tell, no, 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 no. You, you, you can't go out. You have to be approved. And I, I had a department chair said to me about a year ago in, in, in an interview. He said, I, was, I had this alumni group that I wanted to go out to and give them money. And a couple of them said they would. And I was told by the university, that's not our priority right now. So you better not talk to them, maybe later. So you're really trapped in that job. I have to ask you, you said prime the pump, so give them some resources and give them some degree of autonomy. Correct. I think I better go to the last question now. Okay. <laughs> We've done a number of ag dean searches. No one is exactly the same. The demands of the position increasingly, in fairness, they've always been highly political because you are you have an extension service under you and you've got somebody in every county. So by oh. date, definitely. Oh yeah. <laughs> but the importance of extramural funding and the like has changed that job. So let's say 
I, I, I could talk you into being president of another land grant university. <laughs> just try. It's just, it's just, it's just a fantasy for the moment. You take it, and now you got to go hire a dean for A. What are you going to look for? Well, again, you have to look for someone who who has that mentality of of wanting to balance between. You have to have the right balance between. If you decentralize too much and give all of the power and authority to your units, to your departments as a dean, then it's chaos, okay? If you take all of the resources and, and starve the units, that's not going to work either because there goes your creativity. So you have to find that right balance. And every university is different. You know, every college of agriculture is different because it depends on the culture. It depends on, you know, where the strengths are and so forth. But it's bringing everybody along, having a dean that believes in bringing all his or her department chairs, unit heads, whatever, together to, to plan this strategically and really hold them accountable, but provide them those resources, as I, as I was mentioning before. So you need to have someone then, to answer your question, who listens, okay? Who, um, someone who tries as much as possible to to achieve consensus whenever you know that makes sense, but yet is not afraid that at some point so consensus cannot be achieved. Someone's got to drop the bomb and you got to be willing to be the person to do it. And I've always believed that reasonable people can be reasoned with. So as long as uh, you explain to people, once you have to make that mm -hmm. decision that maybe you couldn't achieve consensus over, but you explain to people why, why you decided that. The pros and the cons, you know, even when someone disagrees with you, they, they say, okay, I, I get it. I understand why. Fine. Let's, let's see what happens. As so opposed to, pinch, pinch. Yeah, exactly. Providing them that, that explanation. One, one other thing I would tell you that besides being someone who listens and who can make decisions, you know, after trying to achieve consensus mm -hmm. is you need to have someone who, and this was advice that was given to me early on, which was excellent. It, uh, this person told me, it was a distinguished professor many years ago, said to me, you know, whenever you get an idea on whatever, tell it to your staff, to somebody as soon as possible. Because the longer we as human beings keep the idea, we keep thinking about it, it becomes our baby. And then after however many days or weeks, if I now present it to my, my senior leaders and they don't like it, I'm going to be insulted. I'm not going to then like that person because look, they're attacking my baby. So the sooner you share ideas with people, then you can be more up, uh, objective as to what works, what doesn't work. And then the last thing I would say to you um, is that as a leader, you need to be surrounded by not only super smart people, but you got to have someone who is your cheerleader. Sure. But then you got to have your naysayer you know, your, your devil's advocate. In academia, no, that's never the case. But you got to do that and, and, and respect that person. You may, you know, find them annoying at times, but you got to say, yeah, you know what? I needed to hear that. Yeah. Uh, so having a person that has that uh, ability of not taking things personally and not being too uh, closed and selfish and all of that is, is what's to me the key to a good administrator, whether it's a dean of, uh, of agriculture or, or any other position in academia. You have to have those qualities and they're hard to find, no, no question, they're hard to find. You can hear conversations now almost everywhere that say, well, when this is all over, what's gonna happen? As you look down the line, it's very clear it's what's happened due to the pandemic is likely to cost what fragile, food security there was in parts of the world to completely go away. Is there something we should have learned, from, be learning from this experience that could perhaps, if you can't eliminate that problem of food insecurity, you can at least mitigate it. Is there something we've learned or is there something that we should be able to do that this won't be the last virus we get hit by? Any thoughts on that? Well, and that's a tough question because yes, yes. there's maybe not any one thing specifically, but what comes to mind is we are not very good at risk assessment. You know, uh, if, if we had 
uh, done a, a, a risk assessment of, okay, what if this happens? You know, what is the, the likelihood? And even if it's low, uh, what is the impact? And so be prepared for it. We would have been better off. Now, having said that, now that we have lived through this experience, we need to do a thorough assessment of lessons learned. If we don't do that, we are stupid. Um, and that is in every aspect of society, but certainly in, in academia as well. You know, what are the, the research priorities that we need to have? Uh, how do we, you know, the, the biggest disruption besides the, the obvious of, of human health uh, consequences is, is to the food supply chain. That was affected so tremendously that it's, it's really increased not only the price of food, but as a result, there's been uh, an increase, frankly, in, in, in the number of people that are malnourished. No question about it that uh, we're going to see in, incredible heights in these numbers of, of the children who are stunted, as well as you know, just families um, absolutely uh, under a famine situation. And so what could we do differently? If we don't do that retrospective lessons learned and, and adjust as a result, woe well unto us. Um, and those of us in, in academia that work in, in this uh, development arena, uh, we're doing that already. We're trying to figure out what do we do to shore up our abilities to not only quickly address these kinds of issues, but even use science for developing edible vaccines that, that can be distributed in developing countries against whatever the organism might be, uh, so that you don't have to have the, the injections and all of that, which, you know, that's, that's a whole level of complexity, but, you know, vaccines that, that can be, you know, introduced in terms of uh, genetically speaking into the tomato genome or, or peanuts or whatever it may be. So those kinds of things, are, we really need to engage in, in a thorough dialogue, as well as automation, frankly, automation and food production and how, you know, engineering and computer science, you know, can, can help us with that. I come back at the end of the pandemic, if and when it does, we can talk again then to see if we've done the lessons learned. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's... That's, that's what will be the true test, right? If there's another one, which they probably will be because, you know, uh, it's just the way that biology works. We, we better be ready. If, this, if we're caught off guard like this again, uh, shame on us. Dr. Morano, thank you very, very much. Uh, thank not, you. I don't think you're talking with us today, but for the great service you've given the country and, and your university. And I hope we have a chance to talk again in the not too distant future. Thank you. Same here. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow.